like at times I would sh- give it back to you, and I don't, I didn't care. I was just like, oh, you want to be an asshole? I can be even more of an asshole, and I'll make you cry. You made me cry, but now you're gonna be crying for days. Like that's how I was. But then there are also moments where I was just like. I don't have the energy. Mm. I don't have the energy or the time to sit there and go back and forth with you. This is gonna hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. 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 But to keep, the hope is not just for your parents. The hope, the, the doctors, the nurses, they have to believe as well. Mm-hmm. Because once you lose hope, once you lose that belief, there's no point in doing anything anyway. Yep. You know, so... You obviously, you get through it, you make it. How, wh- what can you remember about the physical scars? It was difficult, um, you know, going into grade school and stuff like that. And I was really shy as a child. I still am a little shy, but I'm more talkative now. Um, and so, you know, growing up, like, all I wanted was my parents or, you know, my grandparents or my sister. Because I was just like, those are the people that, like, love and, like, understand me and everyone else, like... You know, I was, like, scared and just shy. And so growing up in grade school is really difficult for me. Um, I was still in therapy, physical, occupational speech, regular, like, counseling, like, all that. Um, It was very difficult for me to make friends. And, you know, my burns, they were so severe, you know, they were red and pink. And back then, you didn't really see people that looked like me that was, you know, four, three, five with burns on their face, like walking around, like it's just like another day. And kids are cruel. Yes, kids are bullies. I work with kids. I love you all, but we are, you know, they are bullies. And so it was really difficult because, you know, you have a kid like look at you and like just stare at you. And I already knew what was coming. And they're like, what happened to your face? And you're just like, (sighs) like, yeah, I would get nervous and like scared and like try not to cry. But I would cry because that's something that was painful to me. Not be, like the fire, yes, that's painful, but I think like the reactions that I was getting hurt even more because it's just like, I know I'm different. I know I don't look like, you know, Kim K or whoever you want to compare me to. You don't want to look but, like her. Yeah, I don't. But like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, someone who thinks everyone's like, you know, everyone thinks that she's beautiful. And so to me, I was just like, oh. And so growing up, I really struggled with my face and how people perceived me and you know i had difficulty making friends and like you know i was kind of labeled the bad kid per se because well, i would if they're not going to love me <laughs> yeah. i'll make them hate me <laughs> it's not even that actually i you know would go to my teachers and some of them were not the nicest and i would say so and so is being mean to me or so and so said this about me and they would just shrug it off like it was not a big deal and to, for me that really affected me and so when I would act out, then they would do they would do something. But who would be getting an email or phone call home? You know, my parents for me because of me. And so that was difficult. And you know, just trying to fit in. And I felt like I never really fit in. Even now, thank God, I'm okay with that. But like back then, I was like, oh, I just want to be like the cool kid and like you know have friends and you know have play dates with people that like you know are cooler than me or you know that I look up to or you know whatever. All so children difficult. want that. So yeah. all children just want to fit in. They oh, want yeah. to be part of the group. They want to be part of the cool kids. Yeah. And it's not until you get much older that you realize that's just a farce. That's yeah. just a fantasy. And it's not even really that important. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I tell my kids this, too. So um, for a short time, my, my son was hanging around with a group of friends, and they were, quote, unquote, the cool kids. And I said, dude, they're, they're not the ones you want to hang out with. Yeah. Because when trouble hits, you're going to turn around, and those kids are going to be gone. It's mm-hmm. going to, You're going to see tumbleweeds. Yeah. And... It's the ones who you think are weird that are not like everybody else. If you're kind to them and you treat them genuinely, that's how you build an army. Yep. That's how you build a pack, a bunch of buffalo. Um, but it's not, unfortunately, that lesson is wasted on youth. You cannot teach a child no. that. <laughs> oh, by the way, you don't need to be one of the cool kids. No, it just yeah. doesn't work out. Now, go to your home life for yeah. a second. Your parents are still reeling from the loss of this child. Yeah. And now they, you, it's you and your sister? Yes, and it's funny. Um, not funny, but it's interesting. So my brother actually, the youngest one, Christian, he was born a year after. And so he was born in 2003 on October 20th. Mm. Isn't that something? Mm. Yeah. You know, so the, you, I'm wondering, your, your parents, how did they treat you at home? You know, so I'm protective around my children. Mm-hmm. But I can't imagine the level of protectiveness that your parents gave you. Yeah. So when I went home, 
um, you know, the doctors gave my parents a mask and it looked like a Rey Mysterio mask. And they're like, your daughter has to wear this because my burns are so protruded out. You would see my blood. You can see the muscle. You can see it all. It's like a keloid scar, yes. right? Yeah. People would like look if my dad, for instance, this is a story. We were at Target once and this guy came up to my dad and me and he was just like, what's wrong with her face? Wow. And my dad was just like, I'm really about to like punch this man. Yeah. Like, you don't say that. Like, you know, and my dad was like, you know, he didn't mean it that way. But like how he said it, you're just like, what the hell is wrong with you? And so, it's you know, very bad manners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's something that it was like the norm. It was something that always happened. You know, whenever we were in public, that's something that was always being asked. And, you know, you get used to it. And, you know, over time, like, yes, it, it hurts. But you're just like, this is what happened. And like, you can't look at it as like, oh, poor me. But be like, yes, like this happened to her. But like, look at her. She's doing X, Y, and Z, and she's doing great. And you know, that's kind of how you, like, how we deal with things. Um, but did they, you know, as far as you going out with friends and mm -hmm. things like that, did they limit that stuff because of the trauma that they experienced? Mm, no, I feel like out of all my siblings, they allowed me to do not whatever I wanted, but I can go to a concert. I can do a bunch of different things that perhaps like they wouldn't let me do oh, but they allowed me to do because you got lucky i'm <laughs> gonna tell you why it's the guilt it's like well she's been through enough let's give her a little bit of leeway so you are actually kind of fortunate with that i don't know <laughs> i don't know about that i think you know there's four of us three still living like i'm the middle one and so you know the middle child always causes like the bad behavior and stuff like that i feel like seen. we're all no i feel like all my siblings we're, we're great you know kids we have you know good parents and you know good you know upbringing and so um i feel like they were lenient um but like you know they would ask questions like they were like okay bye like they were like okay but with who what time where you know and stuff like that um because you're you, them losing a child i i would perceive that they would be overprotective of you, making sure that you're safe as much as they can keep you safe. Yeah. But a lot of times that's just a false reality anyway yeah. because things are going to happen. There's nothing they can do about it. You're going to get your heart broken. <laughs> you're going to fail a test, and there's only so much that they can do. Um, that's why I say it's a false reality. Yeah. You know, they can do what makes them feel comfortable, but in the, in the long term, you know, fate is fate. Yes, and I also think, like, you know, who you surround yourself with. And I feel like my parents, they knew all my friends' parents, right? And they knew the story. And, like, my friends and I were friends for, like, since the A-Big, right? And so I think having that trust and understanding, you know, kind of eased them. Like, okay, like, Deja Maya, she's fine. Mm. So, yeah. Well, you have to look beyond the exterior. Yeah. Right? Once you start looking beyond it. Did you, did you ever sit down to a meal? Your parents make you this meal and the food looks gross and disgusting. <laughs> and you're just like, oh, I'm not eating it. But what happens eventually is you try that food and, and you find amazing. out that it's delicious. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of the same thing with, with you, especially as you were a little child. You have these exterior scars on you. So people are just looking at that dish of food going, yeah, that ain't my cup of tea right there. Yeah. But once they get, once they try the food, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, this is something wonderful. Yeah, and I think, you know, growing up too, like, no one really gave me a chance. Like, they, like some people knew, but they didn't care. Mm. Or others, they didn't know anything, and they just could give two shits honestly like they're just like okay like she's ugly and weird like ill you know and so i you know yeah so you move on through school yeah and did it get worse did it get better as <laughs> as, as people got to know you? you're in spanish harlem <laughs> yeah um you know you're around a lot of people yes <laughs> that's a very crowded area yeah uh did it get worse better um, so actually, I went to the public school where my, my mama and my mom worked. And so it was great because all the teachers, like, they knew me and, you know, it was great. They loved me. I loved them. It's like, like family. But my third and fourth grade year, I actually went to school downtown and I hated it. Oh, my God. That was, like, the worst time of, like, my whole childhood, like, a part of my childhood. That was, like, one of the worst times. Um, I would get bullied left and right. And it was weird because... K and first were together. No, I'm sorry. First and second were together and third and fourth were together and so forth. Um, and I would just get bullied. And when I would talk to my teachers, I'd be like, hey, Miss So-and-so, you know, so-and-so did this to me. Like, I didn't like that. 
nothing. I would have to cry or like scream or do something that was bad for them to be like, oh, like we have to handle it. But they wouldn't really handle it because I would get reprimanded, not the like the student. And so, you know, it was shitty. And um, actually, my third, I mean, my fourth grade year, my fourth grade math teacher had a son. I was in fourth grade. He was in eighth grade, would bully me every morning. What would he say? Chicken face, pizza head, like a bunch of different things. Like he was an asshole. And I would go to her like during math. I'm like, hi, I just want to let you know like your son said this to me like this morning. Did not give two shits. And, you know, again, I was in therapy. Like I was, you know, making sure like I wasn't like going to like have a big outburst and things like that. But I was just like, you need to like reprimand your kid. Like you can't. Words can hurt. You know? Yeah, exactly. And it really affected me because, again, it was difficult for me to make friends. And the friends that I did have, like they didn't go to my school that I was at then. Um, they were all at my old school. And so I was just like, this is ass. Like, so ugh. You're a, you're, you're a young child. You're trying to find your way in this world. And your ego is always very fragile as a child. Now you have this extra added layer uh, that's going to make it even more fragile. Mm -hmm. So when somebody says something, those things hurt. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those things hurt. But so I want, I want to get out some of the things that you've been called. I yeah. want people to know how bad it got for you. And, and people have to not look at Deja Maya right now. They have to look at... Think back to Dijamaya at nine or ten years old. Yeah. So pizza face, chicken face. I don't get that one. Yeah. I, I, neither do I. Yeah. I, that one I, I don't get. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what are What are some other ones? Um. Let's see. I don't know. I feel like I just like blocked it all out because I knew, and like thank God for like my family and like the strong people that I had behind me. They were like, that's not even true. Well, did they prepare you a little bit? <sighs> yes. But I think you can never really be prepared for that because you can be having a great day. And that one thing that someone says that's like really hurtful, a lot of things that people would say was, that's why your brother's dead. The key component to any law enforcement officer being the best version of themselves is through education. Sherry Alsop is a leader in providing that education to police agencies, preparing them for the all too frequent dealings with sexual assault victims. You've seen Sherry on episode 169 of the Suffering Podcast. She survived incest and almost daily sexual assault, so she comes from a place of experience and true understanding. Sherry has the intelligence, commitment, and compassion to open the eyes of those on the front lines while providing the tools to effectively deal with a difficult situation. Sherry's instruction comes from experience and multiple certifications. Training with Sherry will offer on-site training, customized schedules, specialized instruction tailored from a victim's perspective. You are gonna hear Sherry's heart-wrenching but inspiring survivor story. Learn proprietary trauma-informed training techniques. Uncovered victim-centered interview methods while earning continuing education credits according to your state guidelines. To be the best, you must learn from the best. Let Sherry also guide you through the delicate cases of sexual assault from a victim's point of view. Be a source of comfort to those victims affected by these traumatic experiences while producing a solid investigation and uncovering details that often go unnoticed. To find out more or to contact Sherry also, go to SherryAlsup.com. That's S-H-E-R-R-I-E-A-L-L-S-U-P.com. Oh, wow. Like that? And that's, you're like my, like, you know, you're eight, nine, 10, 11. Like, that's crazy to me. You don't wow. say that. You don't say that. Like, just how I was raised, we don't do that. So there's a great comedian. His name's Brad Williams, mm -hmm. right? Brad Williams is a little person. Yeah. So Brad said, you know, I was, I, I was destined to be bullied when I went to school. He's, he's, uh, he's a dwarf. Yeah. And so he goes, my first bully was my father. Mm. Okay. But what my father did to me is he started preparing me. Mm -hmm. for what the inevitability was going to come. So his dad would say, would call him a name. He says, okay, now give it back to me. Give it back to me. And he would prepare his son. So mm -hmm. by the time his son got into school, he was always down in the principal's office because somebody <laughs> would say something to him to try to hurt him, yep. and he would say something back and make the other kid cry. Yes. So I always liked that story. I always thought that was a very powerful story because that's a that's a parent who was doing their best to protect their child because they see – like they the parents have a little – whether you know it or not, parents are, have a little profit in them. <laughs> yes. Okay, they see what's going on. And I'm sure your parents saw that to you, and they oh, did the best they could in order to do that. But you ultimately have to deal with it. So they have to give you the tools in order to deal with it. Yeah, I think, you know, I would bully my little brother. <laughs> I love Christian, but I was also his biggest protector. We went to school, like, together. 
And so everyone knew that was like my little brother and you mess with him. Like you're messing with me to this day. Like everyone knows, like, don't fuck with my brother. My sister and I will get on you. Like that's how we are. Right. But it's amazing you didn't start bullying others. And I'm going to tell you why, because Mm -hmm. a bully is not okay with themselves. Yeah. Okay. And it sounds like internally you had a lot of these things going on inside of you until you started to become comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. So for you, you, I'm surprised you'd never transferred that on anybody else. So I would have those moments, but then who would get in trouble? Me. And so, you know, I think, I don't know. Like, it just, like, just treat people with kindness. And if they want to be, like, mean, like, fine, be mean. But, like, if I'm going to continue to treat you with kindness, how much longer can you be, like, mean to me, right? Like, and I just, that whole negativity, like, bullying, like, I just, to me, I just don't like that. Like, I feel like that just, like, makes you, like, heavier. So I did did something in the gym. I I have this problem in the gym. And maybe it's the way, it's got to be the way I look. People will zero in on me and and i won't say anything to them but they'll, they'll start it's happened several times it's happened in front of my wife my wife doesn't believe she just thinks <laughs> i'm a mean son of a bitch yeah but it's happened in front of my wife where i just told a guy hey listen I'm, i got a couple more sets on there we'll be done in a minute and the guy came back and started a fight with me mm. so here's moving on they, they, and he's mean he's pissed off and i got pissed off too so but afterwards i'm like this is stupid and i just went up to the guy i'm like hey brother bless you mm-hmm. all right and then I leave. Yeah. Now, here's think about what I did. Think about what I did. I just rented space in his head. Yes. I didn't have to throw fists. I didn't have to say anything negative. All I said is, hey, hey, brother, bless you. Yep. And I guarantee you for the rest of the day, that guy was going, why the hell did he say that to me? Did you ever turn around and do that to somebody else? <sighs> Let's see. I think, like, at times I would give it back to you, and I, don't, I didn't care. I was just like, oh, you want to be an asshole? I can be even more of an asshole and I'll make you cry. You made me cry, but now you're going to be crying for days. Like, that's how I was. But then there are also moments where I was just like, I don't have the energy. Mm. I don't have the energy or the time to sit there and go back and forth with you. And I think, you know, um, you know, just listening to your parents and, you know, even my siblings and stuff like that. Like, it's just like, how would you feel if it was like roles reversed? And yes, like, you know, I was in the same shoe, but I think that, I don't know, like, that's just, I have mean bones in my body and you, like, you don't want to see me when I get angry because I have stories like that. But I think I'd rather just be nice. And if you don't like my niceness and that's on you, like, cool, like be an asshole, be miserable, but I'd rather be happy and know that like I'm being a great person and you're just being a shitty one, you know? So your physical scars growing up, how much space did they rent in your head? So was it all consuming? For the most part, kind of yes, but I think moving to Maplewood, it kind of changed. You know, it was How old were you when you moved to Maplewood? I was 12. Okay. And so I was going into my 7th grade year. You're just about you're hitting puberty, yeah. you're becoming a woman, yep. and yeah, that's that's when things get a little sticky. Oh yeah. And so one of my um family friends she went to the middle school that i went to and so she was telling everyone she's like this is my cousin like she's coming to school blah, blah blah i'm so excited and so everyone was like oh my god like you're so beautiful and i was just like what the hell is going on like that was just like so weird um and i was just like um thanks and like just kept it moving in like you know i made my friends and it was great and no one really mentioned my burns they everyone knew what happened because of this family friend but no one asked like what exactly happened or anything like that, right? But in the back of your head, are you still thinking, yeah, they're just they're they're talking about me? Not really. That's because that's, that's amazing. Yeah, because you know, it felt I I felt like it was like an open like open arms community, and you know, growing up at PS, you know, being in school with where my mom and grandmother worked, it was the same kind of atmosphere. And so going into middle school, it reminded me of that atmosphere. And to me, that's where like I thrive the most. Um, and so it was nice, you know, I have friends from then still, um, but I just felt accepted and welcomed. Um, of course you have this like small little group of bad apples that are assholes. Um, but for the most part, everyone was nice to me and, you know, they knew Deja Maya, like they knew who I was. You got a cool name. L- listen, you. you got a name that's on a marquee, Thank Deja you. Maya. I mean, <laughs> that's, 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 that goes up there with like Cher and oh, thank you. Lady Gaga. I mean, that's just like the name. But now you're coming into womanhood. Yeah. Okay. 
You're, you're, or did you try to cover? Did you try to put makeup on or anything like no. that? But at some point, you had a procedure, an experimental yes. procedure. Yes. To try to lessen the effects of the scars? Mm -hmm. So what was that procedure? Yeah, so I actually had this procedure done when I was eight and nine. And so this is actually when I was still in school downtown. Mm -hmm. And like it came out like the perfect time. And so I got Fraxel Repair. Um, and it was four sessions. And yeah, they just, it's like little grafts on your little, you know, your skin cells. And, you know, they kind of like try to like flatten out the burn. Um, so they were more pronounced yes. when you were younger. Yes, they were. It's experimental. So you're not sure if it's going to work. No. But I'm sure it didn't feel good. I don't remember because I was knocked out. I was oh, sleeping. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. But I remember waking up and I was like, oh, this is such a crappy feeling because, you know, you're knocked out. You're, yeah, actually, it's the best <laughs> sleep you'll ever get in your life. <laughs> Wait till you're old enough to have a colonoscopy. You'll, you'll see what uh, I'm talking about. No, thank you. <laughs> um, it's coming for you. It's I know. coming for you. It's I know. coming. You said age is just a number before. It's not. I know. It's not. <laughs> um, so you're starting to become. You grow into womanhood, and you know I'm sure you're noticing the boys. Yeah. 